So, dear Professor Morton, first of all, I would like to welcome you to our teacher training day for high school philosophy teachers in Dutch education. As you know, an excerpt from your book, The Ecological Thought, was published in the textbook that prepares students for their national exam in philosophy. And over the next four years, more than 10,000 Dutch high school students will be exposed to your work. And the teachers that are present here will be guiding them uh, through your text. So to give a very short introduction to the teachers that are present here, uh, our guest speaker is uh, Timothy Morton, professor at Rice University in Houston. And apart from their academic work, Professor Morton has been involved in all kinds of creative collaborations, such as a published correspondence with the artist Björk, an environmental documentary with actor Jeff Bridges called Living in the Future's Past, and a libretto for an opera, uh, Time, 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 which, by the way, was performed at the Sonic X Festival in Amsterdam in 2019. Some of their written work has been translated into Dutch, the book uh, Dark Ecology, was translated as Duistere Ecologie in 2018 by Boom Uitgevers, and Being Ecological was translated as Ecologisch Wezen in uh, 2010 as well by Uitgever Ten Haven. And their latest work is titled Hell in Search of a Christian Ecology, which will be published uh, on Earth Day, April 22nd at Columbia University Press. Uh, earlier this year, I sent an email to Professor Morton to invite him to give this online lecture at this teacher training day. It felt like a long shot at the time to invite him to a high school philosophy event at the other side of the Atlantic, but I received an answer on the same day. And the answer was, dear Flores, what an honor. I would be delighted to do this for you. Yours, Tim. And of course, the, yeah. <laughs> of course, the honor is fully ours. I'm sure that I speak for the whole Dutch philosophy teacher community when I say it is just wonderful to have you with us today. And the fact that you were willing to make space in your schedule at eight o'clock in the morning uh, in Houston is an act of kindness that makes this teacher training day a very special moment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're talking about this book today, The Ecological Thought. And in the acknowledgments of uh, this book published in 2010, Professor Morton thanks the Association for the Study of Literature and the Environment for hosting the first video conference keynote speech in July 2008, which Professor Morton describes as low on carbon and high on philosophical exchange. And I hope that we can adhere to the same motto 15 years later, low on carbon and high on philosophical exchange. So please welcome Timothy Morton. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi, I'm so very, very, very touched to be talking to you today about, about, about how to work with these issues and how to talk about my stuff. Um, because, you know, we're in this terrible moment and um, the more we can have people thinking about, you know, thinking, you know, what is it? Um, when I when I say thinking, I, I mean, I don't mean something that's different from feeling. I think that's the most important first thing to say. Um, I wrote this word down here, phenomenology, um, which you're probably more familiar with than me. But it's like a touchstone for me. It's a touchstone word. I fell in love with this word when I was 17 years old and I haven't stopped sort of thinking about it, really. Um, but I only just in the last maybe 10 to 20 years got a feel for what it really is, you know. And it's really like the essence of it is how the how is the what, right? How something happens tells you what it is. Yeah. And how you teach is what you're teaching, right? It's like, you know, how you dream is what you're dreaming. How you talk to somebody is what you're really saying to them. You know, and in, a, in an age where STEM is the predominant ideology, there is a forgetting of this, and it's very important not to forget this, especially when it comes to thinking and helping people with ecology, right? Precisely the problem. We know exactly what to do. Stop burning fossil fuels, maybe arrest the directors of Exxon who work over there where I'm pointing in, in Houston, right? For war crimes, pretty much, because they lied to us for 50, 60 years. But why aren't we doing it, right? Why aren't we doing it? Martin Luther King gave everybody a really good reason why 
to care about civil rights. And it wasn't a reason as opposed to a feeling, right? It was a fi- reasons always come with feelings, right? Immanuel Kant says that beauty is the feeling, or maybe it's better to say the feel, you know, like in Facebook, the affect, the feel of true. Yeah, I have a dream, right? I have a dream. It gets you to the feeling, right? All the other, all the, all the, all the ideas slot into place perfectly <clears throat> once you've done that. Yeah. So philosophy actually is the deepest kind of maybe, you know, if you wanted to call it PR, if you were going to be a bit corporate about it, or you could call it ideology critique, if you were going to be, you know, Marxist about it, or you could call it dream work, if you were going to be a shaman about it, or you could call it what I call it, which is advanced psychic combat training. That's usually the subtitle of all my classes, invisible subtitle. I'm like, welcome to how to read a poem class. The real title of this class is advanced psychic combat training um, or mental fight. That's what William Blake says, mental fight, right? I shall not cease from mental fight. Yeah. Why to care, right? Why even somebody who thinks or realizes they're a bit racist can suddenly care about furthering the civil rights? Yeah. How to give people an off ramp, who, p- people who think they don't care, right? This is why we're teaching this, right? That's how, that's really why we're in this room. That's why we believe in teaching, because we think that what we're doing, which is how we're doing it, you know, like science, you know, how salt uh, behaves is what salt is, right? How teachers behave is what they are. Yeah. And that's what we're doing here. And when I see the word philosophy, I don't see any word meaning idea as opposed to feeling. In fact, I see two feelings, right? Roughly feelings. If you like love is a feeling. Yeah. If you're going to choose between love is a feeling and love is an idea, it's a feeling, right? Philos. And then you've got Sophia, which is wisdom. Is that a series of instructions like a fortune cookie? Or is it a feeling? I think it's a feeling. If you're going to have to choose, right? The D-O-M part of the word, the I-A of Sophia means it's the feel of wise wisdomness, intelligence, right? There's this phrase, the tail that wags the dog, right? The feeling is the thing that's the driver. Yeah, we think of the feeling later. We know what to do, but we don't know why to do it. That's the problem. We have to give people why to do it, then they'll do the thing, right? Why they do it is not an optional extra. Yeah, philosophy is not, oh, look, here's some math, even math is wrong. Here's some computation. Right. Here's how to turn people into my iPhone, you know, and then they'll be they'll be out of date by the time this is billions of times faster. Yeah, it's already faster than my kids. Right. Um, This is um, this is how environmentalism is taught. Right. As a series of instructions or as a series of things that we've got to do as this very stem like thing. And it's why it's not happening. Right. Because the way that's delivered is in the mode of yelling. It's in the mode of religion in a bad way. Martin Luther King didn't stand up there in D.C. and go, you stupid idiots, you have no idea how racist you are. I'm going to school you. He said, I have a dream today. He said, I'm imagining the possibility of things being different. He's already won. Yeah. Phenomenology. How something happens tells you what it is. The how is the what. And it's really, really really important with the emotions are more important than the planning because why do you plan anyway because you have an emotion why did i plan to make my son breakfast because i care about him right why do you measure things why do we have measurement because we care right somebody cared about you know conquering indonesia because they were some kind of imperialist colonialist person therefore they created all these measurement systems and they created debt and they created ships that could travel around the Cape of Good Hope. And suddenly there's the Dutch East India Company, right? That's because they cared. Now we have to care in a different way. We have to care about creating a future that doesn't suck for as many human beings and other life forms as possible. So we have to give people a reason to care, right? So all the intellectuality is in the service of something much, much bigger than that. And that's the point of this thing, the mesh, right? That's the real point of it is that it's an idea that really, really works. Yeah, but the way that it really, really works is to clip you into a feeling, right? And this feeling is kind of saying something to you. Yeah, this feeling saying something to you much more deeper than this idea of nature, right? This idea of um, a 
sort of a created by um, a kind of faithless possessionist agricultural society but it's this thing over there right when we say nature we basically mean something that isn't here it's maybe it's under my shirt maybe it's in my jeans maybe it's in my habitual patterns right but it's never directly right so the whole thing is trying to detox people off the idea of nature and get them into something much much nicer better more actually um to use a word which I, i'm a deridian i'm going to say immediate what do i really mean um compelling you know genuinely touching intimate yeah this mesh idea is a is about how does intimacy really feel how does it really feel to know that you consist of lots of other life forms right you're an evolution product so all of your stuff on you is made of other life forms and you have other life forms you have this bacterial microbiome you have little tiny crustaceans running around in your eyelids right and so what is that what is that right it's the connections between everything yeah but it's also the disconnections between everything right because of time because we're not solid because we're made out of time evolution has got holes in it right the gaps in the fossil record are, show you why evolution is true in the same way as the gaps between words is how you can make them mean something the gaps between the sentences is how they can mean something, right? The meaning is never completely directly in there. It's always a little bit off to the side, but it's never totally different, right? There is a kind of duality. When I put that on the chat as well, there's a duality between meaning and the squiggles, right? There's a duality between me and my environment. It's not, I'm not totally glued to it. That's the problem. Like, it, why else would we be worried? Like, if we knew that we were totally glued to it, there'd be no problem. But we're not. We don't feel that way. There's a very simple explanation. Brain signals arrive always a little bit late, right? My sense of where I am, in, which is my body, but also the biosphere, is never exactly on time, right? So this Cartesian dualism has got something in it. We're not trying to fight it. We're trying to change it, but like deconstruct it, right? Let's find something inside it. You know what? You know what it is really? We're trying to see the good in it. My version of philosophy, I always try to see the good in things. Yeah. I always try to see the, the socially transformative goodness in something rather than this kind of, I'm trying to see the badness. I'm trying to see the goodness. And the goodness in Cartesianism is there is a duality between me and my finger, between me and my idea, between me and the me in the sentence between me and this other life form it doesn't have to be dualism but it's this duality it's this play right so phenomenologically this thing here which is the biosphere in my body is in the is is the future yeah it's the future it's never directly here so this funny feeling of i'm not quite here this funny feeling of like there are these gaps looking at biology and you're looking at like how strange it is that i'm actually this thing made out of other life forms and there's this gap between that and how i feel that's how you can know it's true actually this funny feeling of this isn't quite real this is a little bit strange is how you can know it's true you know like when you're in a car accident it's a very real right when you're in a trauma there's a feeling of is this really happening because it's so live right you don't quite know you sort of slightly dissociate right and you know i salute the scientists who are willing to let that happen to them, because that's what science is really about. It's about allowing yourself to be surprised or even disgusted by other things that might make you be wrong. Right? You might be wrong. This feeling that I might be wrong is a very healthy feeling. Like if you being sciencey doesn't mean knowing STEM facts. It means allowing things to be allowing myself to be wrong and allowing things to happen to me, right, that I don't understand completely. So rational doesn't mean disciplining yourself according to some kind of preset format, right? This is, this is called scientism. I put that in the chat as well. This is a religion of science, where you're basically saying, you know, we've decided, we've discovered that Tim Morton is made of atoms. Atoms last longer than Tim. Therefore, atoms are more real than Tim. Therefore, Tim is an illusion. 
That's scientism. That's not science. That's a religion. It's not a very nice religion. It's not even very intelligent religion. And then there's something I'm calling here on the, in the chat humanitism, right, which is reducing things up, right? We know that Tim is an effect of ideology, of culture, of various discourses of what it means to be a human being. So Tim doesn't really exist either, right? Every all of that stuff is trying to reduce the real juicy loveliness of being not quite sure, not quite sure, not quite sure. Certainty is overrated, right? The thing about the mesh that's cool is that it enables you to think really straight, right? But it also allows you to feel uncertain, right? It's as much about the gaps between the, you know, when you look at a colander or a sieve or something, the gaps in between are as important as the connections, right? So when you're teaching this, I think you want to give people this feeling of like there are gaps between things is what enables the connections and the connections between things always make you realize that there are these gaps. Yeah, um, that's that's the that's the fundamental, you know, and why is that right? Why is that? Because we're made out of evolution. I'm only going to talk for a few minutes more. Then we're going to have a nice big conversation. Right? I hope I can inculcate some of these things a bit more. Right. But Mesh is basically saying, you know, this is how being a biological being in a biosphere really feels, right? It's not some kind of zippity do da happy thing. I'm not totally connected to something, but I'm not totally a human being versus everything else either. I'm weirdly connected to it, yeah? Because why? Because I'm made out of evolution, and evolution has got three drivers, yeah? There's three drivers of evolution. Random genetic mutation, random, it's totally random, right? If Steve Jobs was in charge of ears, right? Ears would be tiny little pinpricks because that's more efficient. Evolution is in charge of ears, which so I can have all this stuff on my ear, right? And some of this stuff is from like the pointed ears and then it got folded in and then it looks funny like that. It doesn't help, right? The microphone on your iPhone or doesn't have to have these funny shapes. It hears just as well as you pretty much, or even better in some ways. It's just a point. Random, genetic mutation is an accident, right? Knowing that you're an, you're a, you as a life form are a beautiful accident, and life is a beautiful accident, right? And actually experiencing accidents in the biggest possible openness way is the feeling called beauty, right? That's why to care. Life is a beautiful accident. It might not have happened. This is why to care, right? We can easily turn it into a chemical mechanism where nothing is really happening except for revenge, right? Where one chemical is destroying another chemical is becoming another chemical. And it's just this back and forth revenge thing. Life is the universe having mercy on itself because life is, 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 is exploiting quantum theory, which is the possibility that things can be genuinely different, right? You can have genuine, you can have quantum random numbers, which means things can be genuinely different in the future. And life can slightly slow down entropy. It can pull it back a little bit because at that quantum level, time is jiggling. It's going backwards as well as forwards, right? So life is a huge, big life -o graph of the universe. And this is a merciful universe, not a revenge universe. Mercy is bigger than revenge. And there's a whole lot of politics of revenge right now. You, Netherlands just voted for far right, right? Obviously over here, we've got this fascism happening. And, you know, this is about revenge. Yeah, I am your retribution, says Trump, right? Well, you know, and even Christians are getting into this language of revenge. Well, actually, we don't live in a revenge universe. We live in a mercy universe. Mercy is bigger. And how to teach people to have this feeling of mercy? Well, it's actually about feeling alive. Life is mercy. Yeah, Black Lives Matter. It's a very powerful phrase because it's kind of got that in it, right? Have mercy, you know? Anyway, random mutation, that's the first driver. Then we have um, symbiosis, right? Symbiosis. Also, it's about accidents, right? Imagine you're a single celled organism and you're plopping through the ocean. It's three billion years ago. And suddenly, oh, imagine the organism can speak. Shit, have I just swallowed poison? Right? The basic symbiosis phenomenology is the possibility that you were poisoned. Have I just been poisoned? Did I just let in a serial killer to my home? 300 million years later, no, 
it wasn't poison. It was another single-celled organism. And that organism welded itself symbiotically to the cell, and then it developed into mitochondria. And now we're animals, hooray! Or now we're plants, because it became a chloroplast, hooray! Right? It was an accident. It was an accident. It was a beautiful accident where one life form didn't kill another life form. It just allowed evolution to happen. There is a retrovirus in your DNA called ERV3, and I'm very proud of my uncle who found out about ERV3. ERV3 is because a lizard ate some meat, and the meat popped out, popped open in the stomach, and the DNA came out, like with coronavirus, right? And it got stuck in the DNA, yeah? And then it became this retrovirus, and then it made these reptiles have placentas, and then mammals began. Yeah, the placenta is like a very smooth thing, right? It's like a huge, big biological blow up photograph of the protein capsule coat of a virus, right? Viruses are like capsules of ibuprofen and they've got this little protein coat. The, the placenta is smooth like that. It means that pathogens can't get in or out, which means that the baby can't kill the mother, even though it's you know, quite rightly trying to by sucking all the life out of it, out of the mother, and the and the mother can't kill the baby with the white blood cells because quite rightly the mother's trying to abort the the, the um, embryo. Yeah, the foreign object, right? But be so because of a virus in your mum's DNA, we are now sitting in this room, right? Because your mum didn't spontaneously abort you, which is what should have happened. And really, in the end, birth just is abortion, isn't it? It's just a, you know, abortion that, 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 that you know, it's, it's just late term abortion, which may or may not result in the life of the, of the, of the thing that's been born, right? So life, you know, this kind of life, which is not the same as life against death or life as opposed to inanimate, all those distinctions are implicitly violent, and they end up with distinctions between person and thing or person and machine or, or human and versus inhuman and suddenly you've created this racist misogynistic transphobic uncanny valley right and so this mesh idea is it designed to make you know that we that being alive is is much more it's, it's got all this juiciness to it in fact what it has to it interestingly is queerness in every possible sense of that word and that brings me on to the third evolution driver which is sexual selection yeah, um, sexual selection, the entire biosphere, except for the cloning part, right, where bacteria are just cloning themselves, the entire rest of it, right, the, what you're wearing today, the, the door, the, the podium, the ceiling, the, the quality of the light in the room, all of your ideas about what I'm thinking, everything about that is made out of queer female desire, all of it. Think about it. Right. And since it's queer female desire, right, because some duck decided, oh, that duck's really sexy and they probably didn't even have a choice. Yeah, that's sexual selection. And because the female duck can think that that, that male duck is sexy, uh, you can think the male duck is sexy, too. And a male duck can think the male duck is sexy. You think evolution cares about the female duck? Do you like peacock tails? I rest my case. Beauty is trans. Beauty is a trans phenomenon it's trans species and it's not coded as like feminine or masculine or male or female or anything to do with anything like cis straight anything right beauty is a trans category beauty is a wonderful accident right when darwin darwin famously said when i think of a peacock's tail i feel really sick the feeling of disgust is just a feeling of pleasure that you don't like you know like it's too much pleasure or too little pleasure yeah, if, if you like the look of peacock tails, that's because female peacocks also like the look of peacock tails. Male peacocks also like the look of peacock tails. And that's the evolution driver, right? So random genetic mutation, random encounters between beings and totally trans random beauty for no good reason. I think those are three pretty good reasons to give a shit about planet Earth. Thanks very much. So I think, I hope now what we can do is have a question and, and talk, right? Yes, um, that's true. 
I, I had the mute, uh, the mic muted, so you didn't hear the applause, but there was from the room. I saw it. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> So we have about half an hour left. If there are any questions, I can just uh, pass the mic around and uh, we can have a uh, discussion. So Yeah, I, I, I hope very much that you realize that, that um, for me, you know, the, the, the most intelligent is to think the most stupid possible thing, right? Like a lot of, a lot of critique, like a lot of theory as opposed to philosophy, like a lot of Heidegger is coming from, let's think about the most stupid possible thing that everybody doesn't even think about right like men are obviously superior to women let's think about that bit right so when you're thinking of things to ask right and also when you're teaching your students encourage them to say something stupid it's not just a pedagogical jedi mind trick it's actually like helping us to understand what kind of nasty record store we're actually living in right i call it the record store you know there's all these funny aisles in the record store right like male female, the past, history, leaders, the future, you know, there's all these funny biology, human being, there's all these funny out of date record labels and aisles in the store. All you have to do to know that the record store is weird and creepy is to go to another country, right? Like, like in America, as opposed to Britain, they have the R&B section, right? In the record store, I couldn't believe it when I first arrived. I was like, my God, they have a ghetto for black people music in the record store. And when I told that to my African-American students, they were like, oh, oh my God, it's true. Wow, but even they had not even seen, right? So this is, it's really important to get the most stupid idea in the room, as opposed to try to get the most intelligent, get absolutely the default stupid one. So this is me just trying to disinhibit you because I know that it's, you know, you wanna, I, I, I wanna show that you that I'm smart. So you wanna show me that you're smart, right? Thank you so much. It's really great to hear you talk about this and really brings the text alive as well. So I'm sure that this really uh, helps everyone to convey this, this text in, in their classrooms. But are there any specific questions maybe on the text or, yeah? Good morning, Mr. Morton. My question, as you said, uh, the universe is merciful. Could you clarify a little bit why you think so? Yeah, sure. Um, the zero degree of mercy is just refraining from hitting the other, right? Like, have you ever been in a fight where you're, you, you're in the middle of that, wait a minute, why are we having this fight? What is the point of this? Why is this really happening? Right? What the hell is really, why? Why are we even doing this, right? There's a kind of hesitation there, yeah? In a funny way, I wonder where that actually comes from, because it's a thought, right? And when you think, it's because something is malfunctioning. Normally, you blunder around your world, you don't have to think. You know, when you, when you put somebody who's really good at a task with an e, e, EKG brain, a brain scan, yeah, EEG, um, it's like their brain isn't even operating. There's, a, there's a, um, a show called The Brain, I'm gonna put this in with David Eagleman. You can show this to your students. Um, and there's a thing uh, about cup stacking. If you put it on YouTube, um, you'll see what I mean. He's the psychologist and his brain's really working trying to do this task. And this little boy, his brain isn't even functioning because he's the world champion cup stacker. So thinking is the effect of a malfunction. A perfectly functioning universe that was mechanical would be a universe where there was just revenge, right? I absorb you, you absorb me, I destroy you, you destroy me. Just think about what's going on in the so-called Middle East right now. And the people are like us watching it, enjoying slightly, sorry, watching this revenge happening, wondering when any, when, should there be mercy? You know, maybe that maybe ruthlessness is the point of life, but actually no, because an accident happened in the universe, an accident happened. Imagine this RNA, RNA is like a suicidal person, right? RNA is like, oh my God, I'm so complicated and unstable. I must rip myself apart. But ironically, as it pulls itself apart, it reproduces because of the environment that it's in, like every tragedy, yeah? But they say, Charlie Chaplin says, that the close-up is the tragedy, the wide shot is the comedy, right? 
in the wide shot, this suddenly means that evolution can happen and life can happen out of chemicals because chemicals can accidentally have mercy. Chemicals can accidentally have mercy on themselves, which it might be why I can accidentally think in the middle of an argument, wait a minute, why am I even having this? This You don't have to think, think this is true, but I wonder whether thoughts are actually because of quantum theory in the end, right? Thoughts are huge blow-ups of quantum theory. If you want to study quantum theory, just study thinking, because like a placenta is a huge blow up of a virus. So thoughts are probably big symptoms of something happening, right? Not just outputs of it, but actually like really good photographs of it, photographs of it. So yeah, life is the universe having mercy on itself. And then mercy has mercy on itself because if we live forever, we'd be horrible bastards. So in the end, entropy wins and we die. Right. So mercy is merciful in the end and doesn't let you live forever and ever and become another big revengeful being like Trump wants to be. Trump and fascism is like people wanting to turn into hammers, right? Like Pink Floyd, the wall, the hammers, you know, people wanting to turn it. It's like life wanting to turn into chemicals, you know, um, and it's so easy to do. Right. Like if a black person in where I live puts one foot on your front lawn, there's a law that allows you to shoot them dead, right? So it's so easy, it's so easy to do, but like life is about refraining from that. Life is about just by accident, the mother's body didn't kill the embryo. Just by accident, the embryo didn't kill the mother's body and you were born. Just move to the other side here. Morning, Mr. Moore, and thank you very much for your very inspiring and uh, yeah, inspiring talk. Uh, I was wondering, you were just, uh, I think you were talking about habits when you were talking about cup stacking thing. Um, I'm just wondering, would it be merciful for us if we tried to create more problems? If you understand my question. Yes, it would be. Um, because what is the what, what 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 a real problem would be would be something that you couldn't solve by acting, right? There's been plenty of acting in the world, right? There are plenty, mostly by white European people, men, right? And the more you can get people to hesitate, the better. Um, and so, a, what so a real problem rather than like a a pretending problem, right? Like like a real problem is x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n, Fermat's last theorem. Yeah, or is it times? I can't remember. Right, that's a real problem. A fake problem is I'm going to hit you to teach you a lesson. That's not teaching them a lesson, that's hitting someone. Right? Violence is a symptom of a deadlock in the symbolic, right? Because you can't resolve the deadlock. Some people get really aggressive and they hit the other or they block them on Twitter or they whatever they do, right? Or they turn language into nasty, violent memes, you know, but a real problem is a problem that doesn't, can't be resolved like that. A real problem is the problem that makes you go, wait, 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 wait. And a mathematician is somebody who's okay with waiting, right? A mathematician is a, someone who phenomenologically is the same as an English professor. The English professor, the poetry lover and the math mathematician are both okay with a bunch of squiggles, not meaning anything. And the mathematician's looking at Fermat's last theorem saying, I don't really care if I die. I don't really care if I die right now. If I keep on looking this and I die, that's fine. I'm just going to keep looking at this opaque wall. And the real poetry lovers looking at the poem go, I don't care if I don't understand this poem when I die. I'm just going to keep looking at this poem, right? So beyond and above making it mean something, maybe it doesn't mean anything. Right. Like when I teach how to read a poem, I'm actually saying, guys, what I'm really teaching you here is how to not read a poem. Because funnel, because QAnon wants you to know what the meaning is. QAnon for QAnon, everything is legible. Right. I am a pedophile lizard from space who drinks baby's blood because I didn't vote for Donald Trump and I should be killed publicly executed. I that, that that's a world full of meaning. Meaning is overrated. Right. If you're a PTSD person like me, there's a basement in the middle of your head that says, hey, this just in, Tim Morton is a piece of shit. Meaning is overrated. Meaning is the past, right? We've already decided what words mean. Meaningfulness is the future. And meaningfulness is 
maybe it doesn't mean anything. Maybe, maybe this sentence doesn't mean anything. We have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. Maybe this doesn't mean anything at all. Now that is a really good, I mean, if more white guys could be doing that a lot, right? There would be less everything bad in the world. Yeah. Discuss. <laughs> If I could ask you a question uh, myself as well, um, what I really appreciate about your work is um, the visual metaphors that you use in your texts. For example, um, in the book Humankind, you also use this metaphor of, uh, of a DJ uh, mixer of the two faders where um, to explain epistemology between the subject and the object. And this uh, idea of scientism reduces down and humanitism reduces up made me think of that a little bit. So is there maybe um, a visual metaphor that could be used uh, in this case as well? Um, which case, Floris? Uh, to, to, to explain the concept of the mesh or this yeah. uh, relation. Um, it's, yeah, but when you say visual metaphor, what I'm going with is feeling, right? Like it could be visual, it could be smell, it could be touch, it could be... Mesh is actually very tactile. You know, it's a little bit visual, but it's also very tactile. It's like, wait, there are these holes, but I'm having feeling this texture, but there are these gaps, right? And you're willing to, for the, that situation to be a thing, right? You're willing for your world to be full of little textures that you don't understand, but also gaps that you don't understand. And the more you work with these, the more you, wow, this is extraordinary. This is amazing. I'm suddenly thinking about Lucy, you know, in The Lion, The Witch and the Wardrobe, Lucy is hiding in a cupboard because her family sucks and they're playing hide and seek and she's hiding there and she's feeling around going, wow, this is really strange, these coats, you know, the, the holes between the coats and I can walk between the coats and I can feel these coats and suddenly she's in this magical world of Narnia, right? How to get people into that world of magical, which is basically science, right? Feeling science isn't one plus one is two, Everything means something. It's actually the opposite. Sciency is, wow, I have no idea. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe everything I knew is wrong. When Einstein wrote E equals MC squared, Einstein knew that two weeks from now, 100 years from now, 200 years from now, he might be wrong and or maybe less right, which is even better. And he also knew that Newton wasn't suddenly wrong. Newton was just less true, right? This is a this is really important. Truth is modal. In a scientific age, truth is modal. In other words, there can be amounts of it, right? You can be half right, slightly wrong, nearly right, black and white, right and wrong, it's destroying the world, life and death, self and other, subject and object, master and slave, it's destroying the world, right? So the possibility, like so if you want to slingshot around the moon, Newton is still right. If you want to go close to the speed of light, Newton isn't quite as right anymore. Einstein is right. So this is the thing. Einstein knows that, right? So this feeling of true, which Kant calls beauty, Kant calls it beauty, is also a feeling of, I might be wrong, actually. The fundamental feeling. So it's, uh, Floris, it's not so much for me just necessarily a visual thing, it's what is this visual thing, con what is the feeling that this visual thing is, is conveying, right? What is the texture? You know, like in a, in a way, getting people more to feel it texturally or smell it or he hear it, because we live in a very oculocentric world and Plato is a very oculocentric guy. And the word I idea comes from the Greek word eidos, which means a thing you can see. And we say, I see when we say, I know. We don't say, I hear. I hear means, I understand you, but you might be wrong, but I sympathize with you, but I'm not totally. I hear you, I tolerate you. We never say, I smell, I smell that, right? But maybe we should, and maybe seeing isn't so different from I feel, yeah? Lucy's feeling around in that cupboard and suddenly she sees Narnia. I think that's basically, you're feeling around inside the equation and suddenly you see the answer is in the equation. Wow, right? You're feeling around inside the poem and suddenly you see the, wow, the po this is the meaning of the poem, wow, right? And so, yeah, it's like, you know, to get up out of that cinema seat in the Plato's cave and 
and like walk to the exit to see the truth, you first of all, you have to do a lot of feeling. You've got to turn around. You've got to pull yourself out of those chains. You know, it's like it's a feeling thing. Great, thank you. There was a question on the other side of the room? Um, yeah, I have to yeah. do with four recaps. Um, <laughs> Hello, I don't know if you see me, but I see you and I uh, want to thank Hi. you for your talk. My question was about um, duality versus uh, dualism and the implied space that opens up with duality. Um, mm -hmm. And I became very like wondered about his new concepts. Mm -hmm. And I maybe you want you can relate it to something uh, yeah. like an example yeah. for us to to make it more sure. vivid. I can. I'm a I have started a lot of Buddhism, and I, the Buddhism I studied is Vajrayana Buddhism. And Vajrayana Buddhism, esoteric Buddhism, is how do you convince your body to be a Buddhist? It's so okay to have, so you have these ideas, you know. And, and intellectuals, especially boy intellectuals, love to get off on this emptiness. Like, oh, I understand the world better than you do. And there's this sort of competition about who can make it, you know, the, who, who can understand emptiness the best, right? But the high level understanding of emptiness is that it's not an idea. In fact, that's the whole point. The concept of emptiness is that there are no concepts that can possibly grasp things, right? Dualism is an idea. I-S-M, the ism bit means it's an idea. Duality is a feeling, the ality bit, like reality is the feeling of real, right? Duality is the feeling, so it's a movement. Feelings are movements, right? Emotion, it's a movement, yeah? And the highest level understanding of emptiness, one way of thinking about the mesh is that it's pretty much the Buddhist concept of emptiness translated into English prose without any Buddhism in it. Um, I was studying a lot of Buddhism at the time, um, and um, it's Nagarjuna, but with no Buddhist ideas, really. Um, emptiness is a feeling, right? The, the seed syllable of emptiness is the bar, the Sanskrit sound. <sighs> That's the highest possible understanding of emptiness is this feeling of relief, right? Duality is a feeling, and it's the feeling you get when you're clubbing. I love clubbing. I've just made friends with Dave. Mars Durrell, right? You know, the guy that pump up the volume, pump up the volume. We're like best pals now and we text each other because it turns out he's a fan of my work. And I was in his club, you know, in 1988. And I learned more about ecology from being in Dave Durrell's club, love, than I did any through any kind of camping or reading about anything in, in, in books or whatever. Although I loved going to the Natural History Museum and I love the ecology exhibition and I love the, the whale sounds records and everything, but really feeling it was in Dave's club. And there's a lot about that in my new book, you know, and the point is it's a feeling. Yeah, it's a feeling. Duality is a feeling, it's an ality. Yeah, when you're dancing, you're in this duality situation, right? You're waiting for the next tune and you're looking at your work, you're dancing with the other people and you're, you're working with your body and there's this play at all levels, right? And the play implies this kind of back and forth quality, back and forth, back and forth, right? So that the, in, the, in the dance, these two things are connected, but they're not the same, but they're connected. But they couldn't be, the, they, they couldn't be connected if they were the same. You know, it's mm -hmm. kind of like identity literally comes from the Latin word idem, which means the same as. Identity means being the same as yourself. Being the mm -hmm. same as yourself means being slightly different from yourself. Otherwise, how could you compare? these things if you were just the same you couldn't be identical funnily enough duality identity is also this kind of dance right dancing Wonderful. get your students to dance techno netherlands is a great techno place right that's that's wonderful thank you for your answer just a quick follow-up i don't want to make it too cerebral but um could i compare this this notion of of identity as as um um somehow to to i don't know if you're familiar with what Schelling does um talking about the law of identity in his book on freedom sure you absolutely could um and yeah but there's a whole way in which kant inspired a lot of philosophy that is very interesting it's like a little place in white patriarchal culture that has a lot of little exits in it to other places i think 
you know, and, you know, that, that, so Hegel tried to sort of shut it down. But there are these other places like Schelling, where it kind of opens up into something else, you know, and so I'm very, very interested in, in that bit, you know, why was Kant even doing it? Because Hume blew up causality, right? Hume said, you know, there's no good reason why this billiard ball will hit that billiard ball. You cannot see cause and effect. It's just a statistical thing. Welcome to the age of modern science. The Pope isn't telling you the truth anymore. You've got to go by consensus and truth is now modal and all this kind of thing. Right. And Kant's giving you a reason why your head won't explode when you know that. Yeah. And and Schelling also is deeply understanding. There's a funny, there's a gap in the world. There's a crack in the world. Right. There's a kind of, it's like, in I don't know if you know Doctor Who, but there's a lovely episode where there's a crack in this girl's wall. And the doctor says, you know, the funny thing about this crack is if you took the wall away, the crack would still be there because the crack is everywhere. That's the Kantian idea, right? This crack in the universe, which might be like just one crack or maybe there's like a trillion cracks, you know, object oriented ontology, whatever. But the idea that there's, you know, some that the universe isn't this, uh, you know, it's maybe imminent, but the imminence ha feels like transcendence from this way of, is a way of putting it. The phenomenology of imminence is transcendence. Thank you so much for your uh, inspiring uh, uh, talk. Um, I was wondering, uh, like all the time when I was listening to you, I had to think um, of Kierkegaard, and he's one of these Kantian <laughs> men. And I was wondering, then you called, um, uh, you mentioned that you're, uh, you had, oh, you are, well, you experienced Buddhism. <laughs> so I was wondering, like, do you need an, um, religious or spiritual experience, or do you need that to allow yourself to feel life or allow yourself to feel <laughs> and be open mm -hmm. in that sense? I'm a huge big fan of them. Um, and I also think they're much cheaper than some people like to make them, right? They, 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 people like to make them into this very elite special thing. They have to do lots and lots of training, but probably that's because really they're very, very cheap, right? Like probably a lot of religion decided to put all that stuff into like this VIP lounge so that you were fully domesticated into the religion by the time you got to the VIP lounge, whether it be in Christianity or Islam or wherever, and you open the door and they go, you know, all this stuff about a mostly white guy who's trying to kill you all the time isn't really true. And what's really true is you are this thing or you are part of this thing or you can feel you, you're feeling this thing right now and you never didn't. And all you have to do is notice that, and we're gonna help you notice it. And they all say the same thing. They all say the same thing. They all say, you know that feeling you have where you can't quite get what is the nature of God or what's the nature of mind, or you can't quite, reality, where is it? I can't quite, that's it, that's it. Do not adjust your set. Do not break past this, in Christianity, it's called the cloud of unknowing, right? It's beautiful, right? Just be a cloud of unknowing. Yeah, just be a cloud of unknowing. It's not the same thing as studious ignorance, right? It's another something else, right? It's like, I don't quite know. I can't quite hold it. And if you think about it, this is actually the phenomenology of being a life form with a nervous system, even if you're a plant, right? Why? Because like I just said, signals from the biosphere, which is your body in its environment, arrive always a little bit late. So your biosphere is in the future. This old guy with a beard is probably just some kind of reification of the superego, whatever that is. But the actual primordial thing, which is where mysticism is going, is this feeling of, I can't quite touch it. I can't quite hold it. I can't quite understanding. That is understanding it. That is touching it. That is holding it. So at some point, I take my students, and now I'm taking my lecture people through guided meditation, actually. And I do a thing which in Buddhism is called mindfulness of life. Right, where you basically you sit, you know, and you sort of you, the, the idea is that uh, um, you're just sort of trying to minimize your the input so that you can really notice something, yeah. Um, and um, it's it's not exactly the same as sort of making yourself be very mindful in that kind of corporate way. It's actually just literally noticing that you're alive, right? You're you're breathing. You can feel your Bart on the seat, you can feel your hands on your knees, you know, you can feel your heart. Vroom, 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 vroom. It's a, in Tibetan Buddhism, it's called mindfulness of life. 
right? And this funny feeling of what is that? What is that? It's funny, sort of slightly uncertain feeling, right? It's sort of beautiful, but sad because you can't sort of hold on to it. Beauty is a little bit sad like that, right? That's really, that's a really important feeling. You know, that's really, 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 that, that's like why I'm not going to hit myself or hit the other. It's because I'm tuned to that. And so this is this is a very important question because it's where philosophy, you know, philosophy is the love of wisdom, right? Philosophy, like you're driving the, lo- the, the, the wisdom car down the love street, right? The car is called love, the street is called wisdom, and the lampposts are the ideas. But you don't want to point your car at the lamppost because it might hit, right? Funnily enough, as I get older, I realize philosophy is like you're trying to not have ideas, right? You're tr- in a funny way. You know, but you're, when, when you're younger, especially if you're a guy, you're like, I've got to have the biggest possible idea so that it's bigger than everybody else's, you know. But when you get older, you're like, wait a minute, actually, it's more interesting to try to not have ideas, you know. And then it starts to go into something else, right? Like love of wisdom is it's, it's a deep thing, yeah. And allowing your students to feel that, right, to, to like, when you fall in love with somebody, there's no good reason for it. You just, it just sort of happens, right? That's really, that's really, really, it's even more important than any content about ecology or the mesh or anything like that. Just like, let students fall in love with themselves and their world immediately in the classroom, you know? Five minutes. You don't doesn't have to be a specific religion. I'm very into like I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious, you know. And right now I'm exploring Christianity, funnily enough. I'm exploring the worst, nastiest in the world right now, one. Because I love doing that. I love finding the good in things that are even seen as like really evil, you know, to kind of make them be less harmful to people. But you don't have to do that, right? But I really like this question because thinking at some point is actually the same thing as just as contemplating, right? Which is fundamentally just, I'm not going to do any more harm. I'm not going to do any more violence. You know, to go back to this question about problems, I'm just going to be a problem. I'm just going to be a great big question mark. Exclamation marks are for losers. I'm just going to be a big old question mark. Question marks so big that it is in fact its own kind of exclamation mark, funnily enough. Like that's the joke aspect. Right, that's the sort of smile quality, this kind of knowingness. Wisdom isn't an idea, it's a feeling of wise. Yeah, that's more important than the idea. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we should uh, probably stop here. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Morton, for your time and for really. Uh, adding so much feeling to uh, to your text and i'm sure that it will help to uh, to bring this to the classrooms as well thanks for the last visual metaphor also about the road and the lampposts i think it's a wonderful idea of uh, Floris, can i say can i say one more tiny thing one more of course, thing. Is, of course. What, what 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 you're doing is so important because what you're really doing is because so i've got kids right i've got these two kids that one's 14 and one is 19 they One's just starting high school, the other one just finished. And what you're really doing, you're helping these people not to feel like they want to kill themselves, right? Because when they wake up in the morning, they're facing a horrible world that is our fault. Let's put it that way, right? And it's maybe lots of generations before us fault, mostly white, mostly male people's fault, right? And they they feel terrible. They feel terrible. They want to die. You know, and so what you're doing when you're teaching them, you're you're giving them reasons not to feel like they want to die. Thank you. I appreciate it. So thank you so much again. This was really a special moment, I think, and uh, really uh, I'm 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 glad we were able to. Uh, to set it up this way. So uh, maybe a last uh, wave to the camera and then uh, I'll end the meeting. (laughs) Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.
It's been an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you.